Day 107 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Happy hump day, friends. If you're studying with us in real time, we are back in 1 Samuel today in chapters 25 through 27, reading from the ESV by Crossway translation, continuing the narrative of David and Saul. So before we get started, if you're part of the Heart Dive fam, if you could please help us out by hitting that like button. Someone said yesterday, that's like taking roll call. So if you are saying here, present, that is your way of saying I am here and ready for Bible study. Also, if you could make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, you got that notification bell on so that you know when the videos come out each day. And also, we would love for you to join us in our Facebook group where we continue the conversation after the videos are done. We also have scheduled out throughout the week online Bible study groups, discussion groups to be able to go over the heart checks and to just be able to fellowship and share our hearts with one another. So we definitely want you to be a part of that if that is something that you're interested in. And if you're new to this Bible study, we welcome you. Please let us know where you are in the world. Let us know in the comments where you're watching from. We have got a worldwide Bible study, and it is always so exciting to see which corners of the earth that people are in. If you have any questions, please make sure to check out our description box or the show notes, or you can head to our website, heartdive.org. We've got an FAQ section there and lots of information. If you are asking the question, I assure you someone else has probably asked it before. So make sure to check that out. Otherwise, we are going to jump into it. So let's go ahead and pray and prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the beginning of the week, the middle of the week, even the end, wherever we are in our lives, Lord, we know that you're with us. And so we just thank you for that. We honor you and give you all of the praise and honor and glory because you are deserving of it. You are worthy of it. And we just want to bless you in everything that we do, in our words, in our actions, with our character, with our countenance. May everything that we do, Lord, bless your heart. Forgive us for our sins. I just ask that you please show us if there's anything that we're not aware of that we may be doing. If we are struggling in sin, will you strengthen us today, Holy Spirit? Give us the empowerment to be able to step away, to repent, to about face and move toward you because ultimately that's what we want. God, when we got saved, that was our way of saying we are committed to following after you. We are taking up our cross. We are getting rid of our old life. We know that we are a new creation and we want to live that way. So I pray for your help in doing that. Help us to also forgive others because we know, Lord, as long as we do not forgive, we are keeping ourselves shackled to whoever those people are. We are also allowing ourselves to remain under bondage of unforgiveness and bitterness. So help us to be set free from that today. And I just pray, Lord, that you will keep us on the straight and narrow. Please do not lead us into temptation. Keep us away from the enemy, away from the evil one. But we do know that sometimes you have to allow us to go through some things because in doing so, it strengthens us. And so we We welcome that, Lord, and we know that you will be with us the entire way. You won't let go of our hands. And so we thank you for being with us throughout every single season of our lives. We love you so much. We thank you for this time together as family. Meet every need, Lord. Let every person know you're with them today. In Jesus' name, amen. So here in chapter 25, we come to the end of Samuel's life. First one, now Samuel died and all of Israel assembled together and mourned for him and they buried him in his house at Ramah. So even though throughout Samuel's life, Israel kind of rejected him, they didn't really show the highest respect toward him. We can see here in the end of his life, the way that they mourned for him, it means they came together to be able to honor him at the end of his life. And obviously the greatest honor that he is receiving on this earth is the fact that he's in Hebrews. 11. He is in the great hall of faith. And while amazing work started off with the life of Samuel, it doesn't end there. God is going to raise up a new person, which he already has, but we're seeing it here in the middle half of verse one. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon, which Maon is about eight miles south of Hebron, which is in Judah, whose business was in Carmel. And Carmel is just one mile north of Maon. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. So he's got lots of cars. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the name of the man was Nabal, which his name means fool, and the name of his wife, Abigail, and her name means joy of the father. So, very different here. How is joy of the father married to a fool? I don't know, but it happens. The woman was discerning and beautiful. Now, this is a huge compliment because the only other two women in the Bible who are called beautiful are 
Esther and Rachel. But the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. Now, if you remember, Caleb's name actually means dog. So it's almost like saying he's a dogite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. Now, shepherds or sheep herders, their shearing the sheep was kind of like the harvest for anybody who had farms. And so this was a big time of celebration when they were shearing the sheep. It was kind of like reaping the harvest and you'd throw a festival. So David sent 10 young men and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you and peace be to your house and peace be to all that you have. So David is making sure that he is not intimidating Nabal by sending servants instead of coming to him directly. Now, Nabal is described as a rich man, but as we will find out, he was really only rich materially. And whenever we think about the lifestyles of the rich and famous, this is usually the standard on which we base it. You know, how much money they have, how big of a mansion they've got if they're on the show Cribs. Anybody remember that show? Is that still on? I doubt it. Does MTV even still exist? I don't know. <laughs> but how many cars they have in their, you know, 10 car garage. But we know that heavenly riches go far beyond beyond any of that. Our wealth is so different. I mean, it is found in our eternal future. But even while we're here on earth, we can still be really rich in the kingdom of God. We can still be really rich and live an abundant life. And that can be found in our character. It can be found in our purpose. We can be rich in mercy and grace, peace and joy, because those are the things that have been given to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So nothing on this earth really will give us what Jesus can. There is no Hollywood in heaven. So what's considered rich now that's going to be very short-lived in comparison with eternity. So heart check, how rich do you feel? Verse seven, I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us and we did them no harm and they missed nothing all the time. They were in Carmel. Ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. Now, for most of us in this day and time, we might actually sympathize with Nabal because we're thinking, what are you trying to do, David? You're trying to extort him for his money that he just worked hard for? Well, no, because back in this day, this was like David's way of handing him an invoice for having protected all of his men, his sheep and his shepherds, because anytime there was a group of men outside of the city, that's typically what they were doing. And that's what David was doing here. So when David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, who's David? Who is this son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat and all that I have killed for my shearers and give it to the men who come from, I don't know where. So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all of this. So here we see the root of Nabal's lack of generosity. I mean, he's just simply selfish. He's over here saying, it's mine, mine, all of mine. And he doesn't want to give David any of that. And he's adding injury to insult by saying, pfft. Who's David? And he obviously knew who David was, but he wasn't about to give him that gratification of letting him know that he knew who he was. So it's almost like he was saying, who does he think he is? And so he's viewing all of his riches as if they have been done by his hands alone and not the Lord's. And whenever we view our lives this way, we will be more prone to clinging to what we have rather than having a loose hand and being really generous and willing to give unto others. So heart check. How do you view what you have? Is it a blessing from the Lord or it's all mine? Verse 13, and David said to his men, every man strap on his sword. So here we see a very different response from David than the way that he responded to Saul, right? Like he's ready to fight. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword and about 400 men went up after David while 200 remained with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with them. 
They were a wall to us, both by night and by day. So there it is. He is admitting here, they protected us. All the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know this and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against all his house. And he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. So obviously, this young man knew that he could approach Abigail, but didn't trust Nabal to be able to go and speak to him and let him know what was going on. Verse 18, then Abigail made haste. So she hurried up and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five seahs of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys. So this tells us that all of this was at their disposal, easy to get. So Nabal really could have easily provided for David. He was just being stubborn. And she said to her young man, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she didn't tell her husband Nabal. Uh Uh-oh. Now, I can only assume that she isn't telling him because she doesn't want to create any drama. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under the cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her and she met them. Now, David had said, surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned to me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. Now when Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground, in respect and honor, of course. Verse 24, she fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal. Well, interesting here that she's speaking against her husband while protecting him. For as his name is, so is he. So she's straight up calling him a fool. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. So she is bringing this present as the payment that she felt was due to them. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil shall not be found in you so as long as you live. So she's like, listen, you got to remember to act with integrity. You don't want to do something you're going to regret. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. So this right here is a metaphor, which actually refers to binding valuables to protect them from damage or injury. And the lives of your enemies, he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. Now, I don't know if she is saying this to kind of relate to him in the days when he literally had a sling with Goliath, or if this is another metaphor, which basically means that God will completely reject his enemies. So it's like he's going to sling them out. And when the Lord has done to my Lord, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. So again, she's reminding him, you are king. You don't need to do this. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then please remember your servant. Now, there have been in some commentaries, and actually several of them written by men who say that this right here, when she was saying, remember your servant, was a pass at him. Like she was trying to kind of propose herself to him. I just don't see it. And I don't want to believe that. I feel like that's a little far-fetched and very speculative, but worth mentioning just because of the fact that these scholars felt the need to mention it. I figured I would bring it up. I don't know. What are your thoughts? I don't think that's what she's doing here. I mean, to see how much integrity she has acted with so far, I think they're basing it on the fact that she was kind of talking smack about her husband and willing to dishonor him in that way. But for me, I'm like, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. So she was just calling him a fool because that's what he was. It was just straight truth. But I guess I see it. You know, we really shouldn't talk smack about our spouses to other people. So uh, I I get that. But I wouldn't take it as far as to say that she was then trying to hit on David. 
Verse 32, And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. So he is blessing her for the obedience to come to him boldly and courageously to offer him wise counsel. Wise of David also to actually listen to a woman, which in this day wasn't something that was common. And from working salvation with my own hand, verse 34, for as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me truly by morning, there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. So he's like, I would have killed you. Then David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice and I have granted your petition. So this was good action on behalf of David by leaving it in the Lord's hands and not taking this into his own. And Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light. In the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, so when he sobered up, his wife told him these things and his heart died within him and he became as stone. So they believe that he probably had a stroke at this point and was paralyzed. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. And this kind of mirrors the parable of the fool. You know, he basically died with everything, yet nothing at all. Verse 39, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. Again, another reason why I believe many of these scholars believe that she was hitting on him because it seems like they may have had a little connection whenever they spoke considering that he's now wanting her as his wife. And when the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. So she is still acting in a very humble manner because this was the most menial jobs of any servant and she's willing to do it. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey and her five young women attended her her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. So she becomes kind of like his second first wife, because remember, he was married to Michal, and Michal was actually given by Saul to his best man. So we can assume here that he is no longer married. David also took a Hinoam of Jezreel. So we are not condoning polygamy here. It was customary in this day. And we will find out later on that a Hinoam actually gives birth to Amnon, who creates a lot of grief in the life of David. And both of them became his wives. Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Paltai, the son of Laish, who was of Galim. So in the end here, we see the classic case of vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He will fight the battle for you. You don't need to take matters into your own hands. And John Corson actually mentioned, and I thought this was interesting, the likeness between Abigail and us. So she was a beautiful woman, and we too are robed in his beauty. She was yoked to Nabal, or a foolish man. We were once yoked to our foolishness and our sin. She was barren where we had no fruit either without Jesus before we actually received Jesus. She heard the impending doom the same way that we likely heard about hell at one point. And then she humbled herself before the king, the way we too humbled ourselves before our king, realizing we need a savior. She sought forgiveness, same as we did. She knew David's goodness, which we know the goodness of God. And David granted her her request for salvation. This is the biggest part right here is that when we we seek forgiveness and we ask the Lord to be our Savior, He responds to that. Chapter 26. Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakila, which is on the east of Jeshimon? And here's the Ziphites again. They told on him before, so always gotta be a Ziphite in our lives. And Jeshimon actually means waste or desert. So he's hanging out in the wasteland. So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. So what happened to the repentance that Saul had before? 
Obviously, it wore off, and Saul encamped on the hill of Hakila, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. So if we go back to our map, let's take a look here. So here we see the wilderness of Ziph, which is right above Carmel and Maon. Now, when he saw that Saul came up after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. Then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. And Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. So now he's got 3000 bodyguards around him. Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite. Now, a Hittite was a non-Israelite. They were militarily powerful. So Ahimelech was probably a mercenary soldier, meaning he was just hired for pay. And to Joab's brother, Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, who will go down with me into the camp of Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai went down to the army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground. So a spear was a symbol of authority. So keep that in mind. It was at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with the stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. Now, when he says this, he's basically saying, my first strike will be a death blow. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? So once again, David acting very wisely, still fearful of the Lord, knowing that this is God's anointed, he will not lay a hand on him. And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. So he's like, God's going to do it, or his day will come to die or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But I take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. So here we see God's divine working in this matter. Verse 13, then David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, will you not answer Abner? Then Abner answered, who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, are you not a man who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your Lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king, your Lord. This thing that you have done is not good. So he is rebuking Abner here for not protecting Saul. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. So, you know, Abner's looking around like, uh oh, where is that spear and jar of water? And Saul recognized David's voice and said, is that your voice, my son, David? And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let my Lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. So here we see David's main concern. It's the fact that he has been outcast out of the land of Israel. There is no central place of worship for him anywhere outside. And so this is his biggest thing is that he cannot fellowship with God properly. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. And Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly, and I've made a great mistake." Now, what's really sad is that Saul will die soon after this. So these words are kind of like an epitaph. I mean, they perfectly sum up his life and could be written on his tombstone. I just wonder, you know, if Saul actually believed that his days were numbered, would he have actually acted differently? Would he have had a real change of heart? So heart check. Do you live as if your days are numbered? What would be written on your tombstone if you died today? Verse 22, and David answered and said, here is the spear, O king, let one of the young men come over and take it. 
The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. So David really understood the principle of with the measure you use, it will be measured back unto you. So he is having a whole lot of mercy here on Saul. And thankfully he did, because we are going to see that he's going to need that mercy right back later on in his life, and he will get it from the Lord. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. So here we come to the end of the interaction between David and Saul, because indeed they will never see each other again. Chapter 27. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Okay, wait, what? David is talking himself right out of faith and straight into enemy territory. And this is what will happen whenever we consult ourselves, our own hearts, rather than God. Because Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. So whenever we do try to have a heart to heart with our own feelings and our own thoughts, this is when we will start to get confused and we will come to faulty conclusions the same way David is. Because what we say in our heart can so easily shape our thoughts. It can shape the trajectory of our future. And we really have the best counselor in the universe right at our disposal. Yet most of the time, we kind of treat him like he's an appointment. You know, we're like, five minutes of prayer, Lord, or we will just say the one prayer before our meal, and then we'll check off the box that we read our devotions that day. Meanwhile, we're talking to ourselves all day long, and then we wonder why we have so much anxiety. And Paul told us, you know, the antidote to anxiety, be anxious for nothing, is prayer. Whenever you bring your request to the Lord with thanksgiving in your heart, then the peace of God will rule your heart and your mind. So heart check. Who are you consulting and having heart to hearts with? Yourself, your spouse, your friends, or God? Verse 2, so David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David lived in Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. And while David may no longer be at odds with Saul, he is really at a spiritual low here. In fact, there are no records of Psalms being written during this time, which tells us that he was actually closer to God when he was fully under attack. And now he's going to be living in compromise, which plays him right into the hands of another enemy. Because the devil is not a one-trick pony. You know, if he doesn't win one way, he's going to try another And sadly, this trick is fueled by David's own self-will. Verse 5, Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So he's like, Surely you don't want me to live here in the same area. So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Now Ziklag actually belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. So they were supposed to drive out the people out of Ziklag, but unfortunately they never did take possession of it. This is why it's in Philistine territory and control. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Verse 7, and the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. So in a sense, he is living, quote unquote, at peace for almost a year and a half. Now, looking at it in the spiritual sense, this isn't necessarily a good thing because when the enemy stops chasing you down, it's usually because you're no longer a threat to him. He's like, oh, I don't have any time to deal with that person. Next, let's move on to the next person who's actually working for the kingdom. And I know sometimes that freaks people out because they're like, I don't want to live for Jesus, if that means the devil's going to be chasing me down, where you really need to change your perspective is that life with Jesus is far greater with his protection, with his hand upon your life, with his guidance, than being out in a territory of the enemy elsewhere when you're going to become weak, you're going to become confused, you're going to get attacked anyway, but you won't have the Lord there with you. So don't let that freak you out. That's what the enemy wants. He wants you to be scared so that you will go in the other direction. 
Verse 8, now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites, all three of these people that they were supposed to drive out, for these were inhabitants of the land from of old as far as sure to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor women alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. So sadly, this is not under the guidance of the Lord. You know, he isn't seeking him. He isn't doing what God is telling him. Even though they were supposed to drive him out, at this point, it's out of God's timing. And so he is basically fighting for profit at this point and not honor. And Achish said, where have you made raid today? And David would say, against the Negeb of Judah, or against the Negeb of the Deramiolites, or against the Negeb of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking, lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking, he has made himself an utter stench to his people, Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant." So David has kind of made himself a busybody. You know, he is trying to stay out of the wits of the king, but he is doing things in the meantime to kind of deceive him into thinking that he has turned against Israel and is loyal to him now. So sadly, here we see that root of killing in order to cover up something beginning to grow in his life, which we will see later on when he kills Uriah in order to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. Now, taking a look at some of our deep dive questions, what lessons in marriage can be learned from Abigail? How does Abigail's appeal to David show the power of peacemaking? What lessons in foolishness and wisdom can we learn from chapter 25? And what lessons in integrity, respect, and vengeance can we learn from chapter 26? What would respect for God's anointed look like for us today? Why did Saul stop pursuing David once he was in Philistine territory? And how was this good and bad? How can we relate to this? So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for reminding us that vengeance is yours and that we do not need to fight unnecessary battles. We know that no matter where we go, even if it is somewhere we shouldn't be, you are there to hear our cry whenever we call out to you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our voice. I pray that we never forget this and always remain close to you, seeking your heart in all things so that we do not begin to consult ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for the position you have placed us in. We know that you have raised us up to be right where we are for a reason. So I pray that we will be sensitive to the calling in this season of our lives. We don't want to miss our chance at fulfilling your purpose, for we know that your work does not stop at us. So if we don't move when you say to, you will raise up another. But thank you that your gifts and callings are without repentance. So even if we do miss the bus, there is always another one available if we get back on track. And I thank you for the life of Abigail and the way that she maintained so much truth and honor in every area of her life. She didn't cower in fear, but boldly took a stand with so much grace and humility, all while protecting her family. Even if she was mistreated, she bore the burden and was blessed because of it. So I pray that we can all be faithful like this, honoring our spouses, even when it's hard. And on the flip side of that, we see how the disrespect and selfishness of Nabal led to his ultimate downfall, because you're just. And what I love most about you, God, is how you continually work on our character through every single situation. You know, we all have opportunities every single day to act on our emotion or to wisely discern when respect and honor must supersede our feelings. We know that we will ultimately reap what we sow, so please help us to make wise decisions in all things. I pray that we will have steadfast faith the way that David did. Even when we feel that we are being pursued on all sides and the pressure is mounting, help us, Lord, to act with integrity, even in the face of injustice. So we will continue to trust that in your perfect timing, you will make things right. And even if we find ourselves running in the wrong direction or camped out in enemy territory, I pray that we will continue to rely on your protection and your resources rather than trying to take matters into our own hands. May we always navigate back to you. Lord, we know that life on this earth is so short, so I pray that we live out each and every day as if it is our last. And in doing so, may we leave a legacy that will be written on the hearts of so many, one that ultimately brings you honor and joy. 
but it starts today. It starts now. So help us to continue to do that, to bless your name in the way that we live, in the way that we speak, and in the way that we treat others. We love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive Him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.